Now, I selected some examples uh, of what I call cultural circuits in the brain, which linked actually cultural evolution with the organization of the brain. And um, you have here uh, pioneers, uh, Jules and Auguste Desjerin, who are French, in the 1900s, who uh, identified lesion of uh, the human brain, which are able to abolish, for instance, reading, but not writing. It's uh, alexia without agraphia. And when you look at uh, the lesion, you find it located here, for instance. So it's selective for, um, uh, for reading. And um, this uh, is, of course, extremely interesting because, of course, uh, these uh, networks are not uh, really organized without having the experience of reading and writing. And therefore, you have clearly an epigenetic influence of um, the acquisition of this uh, cultural activity through uh, interaction with um, uh, the environment and through the education in the family and at school, of course. And um, uh, here I just want to show that um, you uh, may have uh, uh, actually neural indexes of um, these uh, cultural circuits. Uh, for instance, um, in the case of um, literacy here, uh, and uh, there are several studies, and the last one has been by uh, Stanislas Dehaene and his group, which uh, shows that, uh, in fact, uh, uh, acquisition of literacy prom profoundly reorganize the brain and uh, uh, creates, if I may say, a new brain, which is, of course, associated with this epigenesis I just mentioned before. So you may understand that in case of art, of course, there is such kind of epigenesis which has been uh, developed. Of course, we ha don't have yet uh, the data to show that, but my guess is that uh, the day we shall be able to develop experiments which uh, uh, give uh, an objective assay for, I would say, some kind of particular uh, cultural aspect of aesthetic experience, then we may see uh, similar circuits, but of course not exactly the same as the one of, uh, I just illustrated. And this also has interesting consequences for artistic creation and evolution that through this experience, there is a repertory of symbolic forms, figures, uh, which uh, can be viewed as cultural imprints in art practice and creation, and which uh, are laid down as cultural circuits in the brain. Uh, this, um, of course, is um, interesting for the normal human brain, but also it's interesting to uh, look at um, uh, disease. I will refer to a few mental diseases in the next uh, few minutes. And <coughs> you have here some illustration, uh, which is completely independent of what I said because these authors have not read uh, the papers I just mentioned, clearly. And uh, what they found is that, in fact, uh, looking at uh, schizophrenic and healthy patients, they found that there are indeed uh, susceptibility genes. Many of them are involved in um, synapse formation and elimination. And it looks that, uh, in fact, some of these uh, uh, features that I discussed in the term of epigenesis of uh, synapse connectivity was altered by the disease. I may document that with you for autism as well. I have slides for that if you are interested. Now, this uh, means that um, there is some uh, disruption of the uh, connectivity in schizophrenia, and uh, it may have some consequences on art processing. I will illustrate that soon. And uh, conversely, it would be extremely interesting to see whether cultural activity, in particular artistic activity, may have some effect on the evolution of schizophrenia. I am not going to say it's art therapy. I'm not uh, it's too ambitious to say that. But why not uh, improve the handling 
of the patients instead of putting them in jails as it is done or leaving them on the on, uh, uh, on the street uh, without uh, help from anybody, as we see, for instance, in New York City and other cities, even in France. So this is to have some piece of comfort just uh, after what I said. And uh, you can uh, really realize that there is a, a lot of um, uh, cultural background in prints when you look at this painting and interpret it as you are, as Occidental um, trained uh, people and having the experience of, uh, of Christianity, for instance, you recognize, of course, the symbols. Uh, and so on and so forth. So this is, uh, of course, uh, not the case here because I'm sure that uh, very few of you are able to, de to tell what it is, while the other one was, of course, uh, the virgin and the child. Well, it is the sacrifice of Pietus, you know? No. Well, nobody knows because <laughs> except the specialists of, uh, of uh, Roman history and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, Greek or Roman uh, uh, mythology. So I am not going to further discuss that, but just to say uh, that this is one of the paintings we uh, gave my wife and myself to the Museum of Meaux that you can see there. Please visit the Museum of Meaux when you go in France. And um, therefore, one may say that uh, uh, the forms and uh, figures from painting simulate what I would call selective recall of uh, stored long-term autobiographic memories of acquired symbolic systems. I illustrate that with Poussin, with uh, Rivals, socio-cultural representation in their historical context and with strong, of course, emotional values, which may further discuss as uh, uh, it was introduced nicely by Steve. Now, question number two. Aesthetic efficacy as enforcing access to consciousness. Well, uh, you may know this painting, some of you. No. Well, do, what do you see? A male or a female? Yeah. Who sees a, a female? Who sees a male? Okay, that's good, 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, it means that it's an ambiguous picture and uh, it flips in an all or none manner. So there is a physiology of access to consciousness and it's an all or none feature. Now, uh, the notion is that uh, there is some kind of space in our world, in our brain, uh, which I call the global neuronal workspace. I will come back on that in a minute, uh, where there is a processing of uh, uh, the access to consciousness and to meaning which accompanies access to consciousness, in this case, for instance, of the ambiguous picture. Now, of course, we start <coughs> with um, uh, physics of the painting, the distribution of colors, uh, the uh, reflection, uh, differential of light wavelength, the activation of um, the, the visual receptors, rods and cones, and of course, an allosteric transition, which is taking place there, sorry for uh, referring to our uh, early work. Uh, and uh, you have to realize that, in fact, the perception of art is um, directly uh, associated with, uh, uh, with uh, molecular biology at this stage. And uh, that you have to realize that everything here in uh, our aesthetic perception is starting to be physical, if I may say. Some people don't like that, like uh, Pierre Rosenberg, who sees a mystery. Something. So this is uh, uh, some of the steps that I'm not going to discuss here because I'm sure you, all of you know uh, of the processing of this um, image through the brain here of the macaque uh, and the dorsal and ventral pathway in, uh, involved in the perception of movement, for instance, and the recognition of objects, faces, colors, and so on. And of course, throughout this processing up to the prefrontal cortex, which is a bottom-up um, processing, then emotions are being mobilized and expressed by the images which are being recognized, for instance, 
in the parietotemporal cortex and so on and so forth. So there is, uh, uh, if you wish, a, a bottom -up processing of the visual image until it reaches the prefrontal cortex and there some synthesis takes place. And the idea we develop, um, Stanislas Dehan and myself, is that there is something in the brain which creates interconnection between the different areas that I just mentioned in the case of visual system, but also in the case of meaning, in the case of language, because you can report what you have seen. And uh, how to interconnect all these things? You could do that by nearest neighbors interaction. This is um, some kind of, uh, of uh, view which is um, uh, mentioned by uh, uh, neuroscientists, but I would prefer to propose to you a, a very simple-minded and I would say drastic kind of uh, hypothesis, which is that, uh, in fact, there are neurons in the brain with very long-range connections, very long-range axons. And um, these uh, were already discovered by Dejrin, and uh, the Dejrin um, fascicles of uh, connection have been, of course, confirmed by uh, recent work by um, brain imaging, in particular tractography. And also the beautiful experiments of uh, Patricia goldman Raki show that there is, in fact, a network of long-range connectivity linking the prefrontal cortex to the parietotemporal cingulate hippocampal cortex. So we have in our brain a long-range network of connection. And our view is that, um, in fact, uh, this is uh, what contributes to access to consciousness, this globality of consciousness. And um, uh, the uh, experience of uh, uh, the painting, aesthetic experience in general, even of music, would be some kind of uh, global ignition taking place within this global neuronal workspace. It's an hypothesis. I offer it to you, you criticize it. Now, if you think a little bit about the evolution of uh, long-range connectivity, of course, this um, uh, is uh, white matter. We compare a rat with a human, you see that there is very little white matter compared to humans in the rat. So there is a dramatic non-linear increase of white matter in the course of evolution, which has been confirmed by Semendiferi and others and many others. Uh, this is from Ziles, who is a very distinguished German scientist. So this um, differential increase of uh, uh, white matter corresponds to the expansion of the prefrontal cortex. I just illustrated before. You remember that at the level of the gene chapter. And uh, to my opinion, just correspond to the expansion of uh, the neuronal workspace because this neuron with long-range axons are much more abundant in the prefrontal cortex than in other areas of the brain. They are, this is a von Economo observation, which is a rather old, but I think it's still okay. So you may view this um, increase of white matter uh, as uh, corresponding to an increase of, uh, of the access to consciousness. And the hypothesis we propose with uh, Stanislas and Michel Kersberg is that, in fact, we have in our brain processes which are modular, encapsulated, automatic here, and um, that uh, the uh, global neuronal workspace is organized on top of that with this long-range action, which broadcasts signals to multiple areas, yielding subjective experience of being conscious, and also give the opportunity of reportability, which means that we may use language to report about our conscious experience. And uh, this in particular, when you have, uh, for instance, perception of an image or of a word, you can speak about it when it has been conscious. And uh, this is, um, uh, I would say, a very 
simple hypothesis we proposed more than 10 years ago now, as you can see. And um, uh, it is uh, uh, with a certain number of predictions. I will show, I, uh, we did a neurocomputational model of this uh, thing. I just illustrate this uh, hypothesis <coughs> with um, uh, two psychological experiments or biophysical experiments about reading. And these were performed by Stanislas. So uh, in uh, this uh, series of uh, slides, which are separated by uh, uh, tens of uh, milliseconds, which are very fast, uh, you have the word lion, which is between two empty slides. And uh, here you have the word note, which is framed by two uh, uh, pictures, which may be called mask. Now, so you have the same set of slides here and there. Now you ask the subject here, have you seen something? He said, yes, lion. Have you seen something here? They say, no, I haven't seen anything. But if you ask the subject to, uh, to choose in a list of words and so on, there is a priming effect which is taking place, which means that there is a non-conscious processing which is taking place. Now you compare the image. And uh, you can see that uh, in the case of, again, from uh, Stanislas, when you have uh, conscious processing, you find that the prefrontal cortex is highly activated, what it is not in the case of uh, uh, the mask words. And therefore, we have uh, some observation by brain imaging, which are consistent with the global neuronal workspace hypothesis. Now, if you look at uh, EEGs um, and ERPs in particular, more specifically, you realize that um, you have uh, a very significant difference between seen and non-seen trials. It's the, the attentional blink which is being used. And that uh, this difference does not exist in the temporal cortex. So there is clearly an access to the prefrontal network, which is uh, uh, being uh, involved here. And you can also see that uh, the peak is taking place around 300 to 400 milliseconds. It's a very late kind of process. So it means that one can objectively follow access to, to consciousness using these different methods. There are other ones I am not going to discuss with you, which are too specialized for a wide audience. So what could be aesthetic efficacy? I have not uh, really uh, uh, made or seen the experience done. I will show nevertheless some slides about aesthetic efficacy and the global access to consciousness. But uh, the hypothesis I would like to suggest, as I said already, is uh, the efficacy uh, of a painting or of a piece of art in general would be uh, some kind of promiscuous access of multiple actual and stored representation into the global neuronal workspace, some kind of paradoxal synthesis of form, figure, color, movement, evocation of memories, emotions, and uh, that would lead some kind of uh, unforeseen harmony of emotions and reason. So this is, if I may say, uh, some kind of uh, hypothesis about aesthetic efficacy, which now opens a field. Uh, and there are a few experiments which have been done already by Zeki, by uh, Sela Condé, and uh, a few others. And uh, of course, in these experiments, I am a little bit critical the definition of what is beautiful and what is ugly is, uh, uh, to my opinion, a little bit difficult uh, to assess. <coughs> uh, the objective criteria of uh, something being beautiful and something being ugly uh, is, is itself subjective. So I have some difficulties with this kind of experience um, I, uh, after what I said at the beginning of my talk. But anyway, uh, I like this kind of experience because at least they show where we have to go. Uh, they show that um, we have to, to progress in uh, the kind of experiments which is illustrated here, 
and uh, which uh, give possibly uh, an objective uh, um, assessment of uh, the access to uh, the global neuronal vaccines. So uh, this um, is um, something which is on the way. There are other techniques. I just want to illustrate one slide here from the work of uh, initially Varela, who uh, developed uh, the um, uh, technology which is to uh, follow the EEG phase synchronization, and which is linked to large-scale integration in the brain from EEG uh, recordings. And here um, is a test of face recognition uh, of a Mooney picture. It has nothing to do with the moon. It's uh, Mr. Mooney uh, who invented the test. But you can see that uh, you can recognize the face uh, when it is in the right position, but when you invert the position, then you, you don't recognize it anymore. Interestingly, you can see that um, uh, you have a very strong activity uh, in the beta bond in the case of uh, normal uh, recognition and uh, uh, quite different one more in the GABA and less important in the case of uh, the unseen um, face or unrecognized face. The very interesting aspect of it is that when you look at schizophrenics, I already mentioned the disconnection syndrome in schizophrenics, then you find that there is little difference um, between uh, uh, the two pictures which is being recognized by schizophrenics. So this is uh, again interesting in the relationship between uh, art and mental disease. And uh, of course, you all know that uh, there is uh, abundant literature on um, the art from uh, schizophrenics. Just to illustrate one from uh, Adolf Wöfli, very well known, and shows the obsessive, compulsive, uh, unhierarchical, self-centered, bizarre kind of uh, painting. But there is a wide diversity of these paintings, which uh, uh, have been uh, extensively analyzed in the past. Not so much recently by cognitive scientists. They should be reinvestigated because I think they offer a new set of uh, information about uh, uh, aesthetic activity in uh, schizophrenics. And uh, just to show that uh, we are very close uh, from molecular biology and chemistry of the brain, fortunately. Uh, and uh, we should not disconnect ourselves from the molecular biology. And uh, indeed, um, this is um, Henri Michaud, uh, what they are, paintings or writings or whatever, uh, which uh, uh, was um, uh, doing this uh, kind of uh, work of art under drug consumption uh, with mescaline, which is acting on a serotonin receptor. So here again, obsessive, compulsive, no uh, hierarchy. So it means that all these uh, aspects of uh, art production are clearly linked with uh, the uh, biochemistry. Uh, of our brain. Now, I will uh, close now in the uh, next 10 minutes uh, by um, uh, the third question, which is the, perhaps the most difficult one, which is the rules of art. And I may quote Braque. And uh, he said, J'aime la règle qui corrige l'émotion. Uh, I ask the same question to uh, um, a musician. Pierre Boulez, I said, oh, I, th I think I, I like, uh, 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 j'aime l'émotion qui corrige la règle. That's the way he put it this way. So uh, there is clearly some relationship between rules and emotion, that's for sure. Uh, so Braque is in one uh, direction. He's too emotional and the rules are correcting it. And uh, perhaps Pierre Boulez is not uh, enough emotional and uh, and the uh, emotion is going to uh, create the rule or whatever. Uh, this is, um, I think, an interesting relationship. And um, why to have these rules? Well, simply because that any neuroscientist being concerned by the number of neurons in the brain and the 10 to the 15 synaptic connections would say that there is um, an enormous number of representations which can be made by the brain at any instant of the life. The number of uh, 
of, uh, of a combination of nerve cells able to contribute to patterns of neurons is gigantic. It's immense. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this is not uh, something that we are using uh, efficiently. But uh, I will remember um, a discussion I had with, uh, uh, with Amit, who was a distinguished uh, Israeli scientist, of a model we did on uh, spin glasses. And after my presentation, he said, uh, how many years do you think that this kind of combination is going to be reached by the brain? I said, no. Maybe 100 years. OK. So uh, this is something that we have to keep in mind, is that um, if there was free access to uh, the combinatorial power of the brain, then it would mean, or uncontrolled access, it would mean that uh, to reach a well-defined combination, it would take uh, years. So it means that there is something else which is taking place. <coughs> and the notion is that, um, in fact, there are rules which are, in fact, controlling uh, this uh, combinatorial explosion, and which may, in fact, impose top-down restriction on possible representation, and which define, let's say, the style of the artist. And um, uh, there are uh, discoveries being made now about rule acquisition, uh, which has some link with uh, uh, neuroeconomics. These are uh, things which are very popular uh, at this stage, and uh, where one can uh, uh, map uh, the areas of the brain which are involved in the uh, uh, generation of uh, abstract rules. And of course, you can see here immediately that the prefrontal cortex has a very strong um, mobilization uh, activity during this uh, uh, mobilization of, uh, of uh, connections, uh, which may act some kind of scaffolding, uh, which would uh, control in a top-down manner uh, what the artist is uh, creating. and. Um, give to the artist his uh, personal style uh, linked to its own experience and so on and so forth. So I just want to flash a few of these rules. Now, uh, this also may contribute to our definition of the work of art as I started in my presentation. Well, one is, uh, of course, novelty. We would never accept to have something which has been already said, painted, heard before. An artist is a creator. He has to be new all the time. This is not unique to artistic creation. I think uh, scientific creation with the nuances I introduced before uh, also require a constant search for new answers, for unanticipated responses. And I show you Jeff Koons. Some people like him, others don't. Well, it's a very unanticipated, as you can see. Yet, if I was flashing to you Jeff Koons 100 times, you would become tired. And uh, there would be what I call an aesthetic fatigue, simulation of brain mechanism, which uh, may be involved in uh, the search for novelty, like the orientation reaction of Pavlov and Sokolov and uh, of attention, mobilizing the attention, which is absolutely essential for access to consciousness, as uh, Posner has mentioned in the past. So there is a need for novelty. It's not enough. Here is a um, uh, further uh, illustration of um, uh, the brain uh, imaging of surprise. And you can see here that uh, when you see an unanticipated image, then there is a strong activation of the prefrontal cingulate cortex, as expected. And the practice, then, then there is a, a decrease of prefrontal activity and a routine kind of uh, activity taking place for, here in the visual cortex. So uh, there are neural bases for uh, uh, the uh, 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 surprise or novelty rule. Now, I would like to illustrate uh, another aspect, which is, uh, to me, one of the most important, which is 
what I call the consensus partium. In fact, the word is not by me, it's by Fray Alberti. It's a long tradition in um, Greek or Roman art uh, to uh, have a, a search for harmony, uh, the coherence of the parts within the whole. And this is absolutely essential. I don't think there is any piece of art which is missing this rule. And uh, that's, I think, maybe one of the most characteristic features of an artistic composition. It's not a landscape, it's not an object that I see on, uh, on my desk, except when it is Marcel Duchamp. Well, we can come, come back on that later on. But uh, clearly, there is a, a search for this kind of regularity within the painting as a whole, as I said at the beginning in my introduction, a whole world in itself. And if you look at uh, uh, the work that uh, uh, Matisse did uh, to paint this reclining nude I just illustrated before, you can see that, that, that he started with this painting and then progressively reorganized completely the picture just to the end. And he, all these pictures are exhibited in the Baltimore Museum and uh, testify of the researches that uh, uh, he has done. And you may have seen the Clouseau uh, film, a movie of uh, Picasso painting, which is less uh, uh, convincing to my opinion. And uh, here is clearly, there is a search for a consensus partium. And I put in the background some music just uh, to tell you that there are indeed researches which are being made about harmony in music, which is extremely easy to do compared to harmony in the visual arts, which is more difficult to apprehend. It is possible, but not too easy. So there is here clearly a trial and error Darwinian process, of course, epigenetic, in search for the consensus partium or harmony. Another um, point which is also shared with science is parsimony. Uh, and um, I think uh, Herbert Simon, the famous um, computer scientist and economist uh, gave a very interesting definition of parsimony. It consists in finding simple distribution in the middle of complex distribution and disorder. Or, if you wish, the beauty of a scientific proposition lies in the fact that it explains much from little. And he has a whole reasoning about, um, a whole theory about the evolutionary uh, explanation of how the brain developed parsimony in humans. And this is something we, which is, uh, of course, evident in many paintings. Now there is, uh, as a second aspect, so what I showed in the, uh, in the consensus partium parsimony, it's really the way uh, the painting itself is being organized. Now this, uh, the use of the painting in the communication at the level of the society, in social communication, and uh, the ability that one has to uh, represent oneself as another. This is uh, uh, the words are uh, from Paul Ricoeur, uh, the famous French uh, moral uh, philosopher, and it, which is the search for shared recognition or compassion or whatever. This is from Jacques Louis David, yesterday for the Serment des Horaces, the oath of the Horacii. And uh, one can indeed uh, have brain correlates um, for uh, empathy, for suffering. Uh, when here you can see, uh, one can compare uh, the pain uh, feel by somebody and the pain uh, um, uh, recognized 
by uh, the partner looking at you when you feel the pain. Uh, so looking at somebody suffering pain and suffering pain oneself um, stimulates some brain areas which in several instances are shared. So they are in common image for pain to the self and pain to the other. So there are neural circuits for empathy. Now, uh, art has a social function. And this is something which is, to my opinion, not enough explored. It makes us aware of oneself as another. And uh, as an example, the, uh, the artist is always attempting to share his view of the world, his or her view of the world. And uh, this is uh, very clear in uh, Poussin, uh, what he called the exemplum from the uh, uh, Roman tradition. And here uh, you have an example from Picasso, of course, with Guernica, you already mentioned, and this um, uh, manifesto against the suffering inflicted by wars. And therefore, um, there is clearly in the artistic communication an efficient secular vehicle of ethical message at the level of the society. And I think to me it's a, one of the most important aspects of uh, artistic creation, even in a very secular condition, uh, even in street art, perhaps more even in street art, when um, you look at Keith Haring and uh, the way he tried to convey his message. So I'm concluding now. Uh, we may say that uh, aesthetic contemplation is a concerted mobilization of groups of neurons uh, that unite representation elaborated by the prefrontal cortex together with the limbic system. I think we are it's hard to disagree about that. It's a very early statement that I made many years ago. Now, I would uh, like to uh, emphasize this um, unforeseen synthesis of, uh, of uh, artistic uh, perception, uh, which uh, uh, is, uh, to my opinion, a more recent view, uh, which has been of, uh, on our possibility to have objective measurements of uh, access to consciousness. And it would be, of course, extremely interesting to try to further specify this aspect. And uh, last but not least, I think um, art introduces uh, some kind of um, uh, order in uh, an unlabeled, meaningless world by offering socially shared creations. And um, therefore, it's a fundamental system of intentional communication uh, at the social level with uh, a constant renewal, as I said, but apparently without progress. This is my last slide. And this is from Matisse, Bonheur de Vivre. I hope I uh, convey to you this feeling. Thank you very much.